Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Jason Falls Show. That makes me your host, Jason Falls. How about that? I apologize in advance. <laughs> Today on the program, we are going to uh, talk to Holly Spaeth. She is the Director of Corporate Branding and Partnerships at Polaris. You may uh, know that name as being one of the world's most popular snowmobile brands. Her company also produces one of my aspirational guilty pleasures. I've always wanted an Indian motorcycle. I don't have one. Um, I don't know why I don't have one other than I probably can't afford one at this point, but uh, I've always wanted one. And for the longest time I was married and you know how that goes. There's, there's someone standing in the way of you living your dreams. <laughs> I'm kidding. Not married anymore. So there you go. That's a different show for a different time. Anyway, we're going to talk to Holly about the adventure brand space and her role in managing the corporate end of things there. We'll also have a bit of a history lesson in store for today after we talk to Holly. And a good bourbon toast will be a part of that, yes, even this early in the morning, because today, March 3rd, is Bottled in Bond Day. I'll explain all that a little bit later. I'll have a little mini report as well from my talks. Yes, I wound up giving two at the Dad 2.0 Summit over the weekend, so I will catch you up on that as well. But first, in 2016, the Community Foundation of Louisville found itself looking to solve a big problem. They are a nonprofit uh, that connects other nonprofits, donors, and community partners to create what they call lasting impact in the community. So when different people want to do some good in the Ville, they help connect the dots so resources are used efficiently. The right people can talk to each other and all that stuff gets done. But they do so much. They help schools, environmental organizations. They help fund scholarships. There's so many causes and organizations that they help to explain what they do concisely. So how on earth can they do just that? Tell people what they do so they can motivate people to help them do it. Fortunately, a guy named Chris Strub came to speak to them back in 2016. He was using Switcher Studio, which was new at the time, to do live streaming for his business. He told them if they weren't doing anything in front of the camera online, they were missing out, and they listened. They started using Switcher Studio, namely for their Give for Good in 2017. Chris came back and co-hosted that. They live streamed on Facebook and started telling the stories of all the organizations and causes and people right there in the community of Louisville they were helping. In 2018, they did a live video stream every hour on the hour during the Giving for Good effort. They created 40 videos and told dozens of stories. And guess what? The professional looking video, multiple camera angles from camera one to camera two to camera three, using fancy graphics on the screen, even inserting B-roll footage of their work or their partners, all controlled by one person with one finger on an iPad. Game changer. How big of one? How about $5.4 million raised in 24 hours for over 500 nonprofits? They increased donations year over year by almost 20%. I'll pause while you pick up your jaw. Go live, tell your stories, look professional without the cost. All you have to do is go to that wonderful URL that if you're watching on the LinkedIn live stream is appearing on your screen now, switcherstudio.com slash falls. Make sure you use that URL. There you can start a free two-week trial. After your trial, you can use the code falls and get 10% off your subscription for as long as you have it. As long as you don't cancel, 10% off forever by using the code falls when you sign up. Can you believe that? 10% off for life as long as you don't cancel. That's awesome. Switcher Studio, they make our live recordings of this very podcast look professional the host uh, notwithstanding, uh, and they can do the same for your live streaming. So go to switcherstudio.com slash falls. And if you are dialing in to the live LinkedIn recording of the podcast over here on the interwebs, you can jump over to the comment section and ask questions and interact with us here on the show. I usually have to disclaim uh, that it's technology permitting, and I'll go over and see if the technology is indeed permitting uh, I am broadcasting, so that's good. And the technology is today permitting. Jason Mudd says, hey, brother, how are you? Good to see you, Jason. Uh, Hosseline Maine is back. Que pasa from Boston? Que pasa, senor? Um, and he says the mic is cracking today. Well, that's interesting. I don't know what we can do to fix that. So we will do our best to uh, soldier through. Felix Kao is here. He was our guest last week. So good morning, Felix. Uh, hopefully you guys can help overcome or I can... You guys can soldier through the mic cracking. I'm not sure what's going on. Let me check my cords. Of course, I'm going to do something and unplug everything, I'm sure. Well, hopefully, uh, everything will come through 
fairly clear and the mic cracking won't be a big problem. So, but thank you guys for chiming in and keeping us honest and keeping us flowing here. I know a few other people uh, are stopping in. Jonathan Gabby is here again. I see him in the chat session. So thank you for coming to by Jonathan. Again, if you have questions or comments during the show, all you got to do is jump in that chat session on LinkedIn and let me know if you have any, if you're listening on the podcast, well, you're probably not listening to the live show. So you can just email me or something and we'll figure that out later. All right. Uh, without any further ado, it's time to uh, bring on our wonderful guest to the program. Uh, Holly Spath is the director of, where did the thing go? Now my script jumped on me. Whew, she's the director of corporate branding and partnerships at Polaris. They're known for snowmobiles, motorcycles, uh, off-road vehicles, boats, and more, and are one of the top adventure brands out there. Holly, good morning. Thank you for uh, getting up in the in the cold Minnesota morning for us today. Good morning. It's great to be here. Well, I, I know that you've been at Polaris for probably about eight years or so now. I believe all that time has been sent, spent on the corporate side versus the brand side. But break it down for us. How's your company structured with branding and marketing activities on the corporate, you know, sort of top part of things and, and then all of the different brands that you have to work with? Yeah, so in my, you know, 16 years of my career, I've spent 15 of them doing digital marketing uh, and about half of them were at agencies and then half of them now have been at Polaris. And for my first turn at Polaris, I was working in a shared function area. So it could be deemed as corporate, but really it's a function. So we were part of a shared service that supported the entirety of the company as it related to digital marketing activities from social media to email to web. Then uh, I was tapped on the shoulder about a year and a half ago to lead our efforts to drive our evolved branding campaign for the organization. And so really how we're layered is that we've got functions and we've got the global business units. And the functions, as I kind of noted before, support the global business units in a variety of things. So if we take partnerships, for example, uh, myself and my team member, Holly, yes, it is Holly squared, uh, we will evaluate something as it relates to the entirety of the organization. And sometimes that mean that will means it'll pa we'll pass it over to a global business unit and say, hey, this is really something for off-road. Uh, or we may look at something, we had two of these yesterday, where we figure out how the person might play across the entirety, person or brand, and could showcase boats, and could showcase off-road vehicles, and could showcase some of our aftermarket brands like our apparel company, Klein. So really, the structure is you've got these global business units that have marketing and product product capabilities, and then you've got functions that support those in a variety of ways. Very nice. So uh, what I'm what I'm getting at here is uh, uh, how much weight do I have to pull or how much weight can you pull to get me a motorcycle? That's what I'm going for. To be honest, you won't be the person who's ever first person to ask that question and probably not the last. People meet me and then ask me how they get a discount. Um, so <laughs> I it, think of it as I am part of that team. I am part of the off-road team. I am part of the boats team. Um, we kind of pitch hit, jump in and help drive whatever activation or item it might be. And sometimes that's helping them develop brand standards or utilize the corporate ones. Sometimes again, it's a partnership element. It really, it really just social media because I have it in my background. Um, you know, it's sort of like we're a little bit of every single company that we've got. Very nice. Yeah. I, I can't imagine uh, being a uh, associated with a brand where everybody wants one. Mm -hmm. right? so, uh, that would be, that'd be tough. So I don't envy you having to fend that off just for, for those of you joining us a little bit late, apparently I'm having some uh, clicking in my microphone. So hopefully we can uh, uh, look past that. I'm trying to figure out what the problem is, but without ruining the broadcast and I'm just going to have to let it slide, but I apologize for that, but I'm sure everyone can hear what I'm saying. Holly can, and you can hear Holly very clearly. So that's good. That's the important part. So I know Holly that you guys at Polaris have over 30 brands. I think the last number I saw was like 6 billion in sales. So we're not talking a small company here. How many employees do you have company wide? Uh, roughly 13,000 globally. Uh, and that's going to range from manufacturing employees at our various facilities, 14 of which are based here in the US. The newest of those is our plant in Huntsville, which we built from the ground up in 2016, um, as well as the various facilities we have to kind of support the entity as, as a whole from manufacturing to operations to lean to product design, um, inclusive of an industrial design offering that has an entirely baked 
uh, effort. I always love when people come join us. The facility that I sit in is our global headquarters uh, and we have a clay plant. And so someone new will come and be like, oh, let me go show you something. And they're just blown away that there's sculptors back there working in clay. So um, not only are we global and we have a lot of employees, we've got some really cool stuff that you might not ex anticipate or experience in other organizations. Is it is it is it clay plant like uh, you know Demi Moore Patrick Swayze ghost clay plant like just like that? Stuff? I'm gonna tell our VP of industrial design that's what he's missing in there is the full you know the soft song and and you know it's it's good for couples therapy. Just yeah, bring HR might in. have a feeling about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm yeah, that's, that's a whole <laughs> I, I'm one of those people who asks forgiveness, not permission. So I would be in trouble in that situation. I guess. There you go. Um, okay. So um, for the marketing folks out there, I think a lot of people understand the idea of being on the brand marketing side of things, um, working for a snowmobile line or the motorcycle line, or even a given you know, product off the shelf. What is the purpose or the focus of the corporate team versus those product centric folks and how does working in that sort of you know discipline there with the other brand marketing folks probably in the same room or on the same floor how does that how's that work you're really working to break down silos so if we think about partnerships because we've talked about it as well or influencer marketing if you want to think about it like that uh, what we'll find is that because you have marketers sitting in a global business unit for Indian and you have global you have a marketer sitting in a global business unit for snowmobiles, they're not necessarily connecting with each other. So what we try to do is we try to think in a space where we don't have any favorite children and how can we look at opportunities across the board for people. So if you use a brand like a Red Bull, um, there's probably viability for all of those brands and how can we think about it for them? The other thing that it does is it helps us think about some of those smaller business units where say we have a full um, commercial government and defense business. So we have contracts with the US government and other governments with vehicles that can support our military in what they do for their jobs, keep them safe. Um, they have less people on their team because it's a smaller unit. How can we think about if we fly at the top with a brand like a Red Bull or a Rockstar, giving them opportunities that they maybe couldn't get if you were thinking just in a single effort. So it allows us to be that cross-platform voice uh, that can be really helpful for everyone. And then it also gives just extra sets of hands for certain things. So again, we kind of play at this level to help the whole. And I can't, I, I bet there's a bunch of brand marketers out there right now saying, what, that extra set of hands? What? I know, I know. It's the, yeah, we're a little bit of a strike team sometimes where we're coming in like, hey, we need to work on this thing or we need somebody to negotiate a contract or can you think about it like this? Or someone talked to us about a golfer and we're like, okay, well, what are they interested in? Here's what that looks like for our entire portfolio. Maybe we can negotiate it a little differently and kind of help everybody out. Very nice. Now, I know you were on the digital marketing side of things for a bit I before was. you, you know, took over the corporate branding lead. So what's the difference in the in a digital marketing role on the corporate side versus, say, one with Indian or, or the off-road set? Yeah, it really comes back to that focus. You know, if you're someone who's hyper focused on telling the story of the Indian motorcycle brand, you're going to spend all of your time focused on telling that Indian motorcycle brand. Someone in the corporate entity is thinking about how can I tell that Indian motorcycle story connected to the Polaris Inc. story? How are we showcasing it in a way that's supportive of their brand, but also supportive of the family that it's a part, a part of? And in that example, it can be interesting because sometimes, you know, you're deciding how much connectivity would you like versus a brand like Polaris Snowmobiles that that's the foundation of how we started. It happened in Roseau in 1954. We still make machines there. Um, you know, they have a different place to play in that. So as an example, in October, we launched our first ever corporate led cross platform commercial campaign, the history of the company. And in it, you saw Razor and you saw Ranger and you saw snowmobiles and you saw Indian motorcycle and you saw our climb product and you saw slingshot and you saw all these different elements that make up what Polaris is. So we're thinking about how that story connects together while they're thinking about that brand element. The other thing I would say is that when you're on the brand teams and marketing, you're really trying to think about how you're showcasing features, benefits, options that make your product unique 
versus competitors. At that corporate level, we're really thinking about the brand holistically. So we're probably flying also a level up as it relates to that sort of aspirational, why would you fit with Polaris products? Um, so just a little bit different. It doesn't mean that brands won't also look at their brand and showcase that, but they also have to showcase that true messaging about why their product is special, unique, why you should pick it. Okay, so I know you can probably hear me, but I've, I've had a cr crazy computer problem go on here, and I'm trying to get myself back on camera, uh, which is going to be which is going to be fun. <laughs> so here's my computer, and you can see that it has rebooted itself. Uh, this is amazing to to have happen. All right, let me Jason? see if I can switch my camera real quick here, and if not, I'll just turn the damn thing around and and wing it. Um, this is the fun of doing a live show. <laughs> Great, um, and even my questions. So I think the next question, while uh, while I'm trying to figure this out, I've got you on camera, uh, and so I'll try to figure out my camera issue. Um, so my next follow up to you was: if someone is coming out of college, uh, you know, grad school or whatever, and they're trying to debate back and forth between um, uh, a, a a career in marketing, whether on the branding side or on the uh, on the or on the brand side versus the corporate side. What advice would you give them in terms of like skill set, skill set, background, temperament, whatever that, hey, if you're this, you're probably more attuned to brand versus corporate and vice versa? Yeah. You know, this question to me is a little bit like when people used to ask corporate or agency, um, you know, I, I really think what you're aiming at is culture and you're aiming at the work and you're aiming at what sounds interesting to you. Uh, that being said, one of the things that I think from a corporate perspective becomes easier is having some agency background because you understand how to float between a lot of things. You understand how to float between a lot of brands. You understand how to think about all those things, wear these different hats. Um, and that's what ultimately got me into a shared function area while I've been working at Polaris. And because I had that background in the shared function area, when we started looking at the corporation as a whole, um, it, I had a lot of relationships that I could use to figure out how to tell our story and then had a perspective on the various brands. So, you know, I think if you're someone who is kind of interested in doing lots of different types of things, uh, it's a really good opportunity to think about how could I get a pathway in? And I think agency is a good way to do that because you'll generally have way more than one client. Uh, on the flip side of that, the perk from being on a brand team is you, you get to go really deep. And one of the things we really believe at Polaris is giving our good people more. So if you go on a brand team and you crush working on that, it's very likely you're going to get an opportunity to go try something else, work on a different brand, work on corporate, work on something that's interesting for you. So, you know, I first aim at culture, what's the work you're going to do. But ultimately, if you're thinking corporate side, brand side, think about, can I wear a lot of hats? What are ways I can learn about wearing a lot of hats? Or do I really want to dive super duper deep on something and then maybe later get that opportunity to think across the, the whole entity? There's not really a, a better or worse. Um, it's just different. Yeah. Good deal. I think we have the technical issues fixed on this end, I hope. Fingers crossed, knock on wood. Thanks for hanging in there oh, with me. A lot of people would just give up and hang up. So. happens. I'm very aware. <laughs> I spent a lot of years in digital marketing. You're <laughs> yeah. trying to make it work. It's fun. We've had LinkedIn has futzed out on us before, just killed the broadcast right in the middle of it. And 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 we've had guests who have, for one reason or another, didn't show up. Uh, but I've never had my core computer just go, hey, I'm going to just turn off. The, uh, we had a very sort of infamous story in the digital world when we were relaunching Indian Motorcycle at Sturgis. Uh, we tested the internet. We had dropped a line. Uh, I was running Indian Motorcycle social media at the time. So my job was to bring to life that we have revived this brand. And we had a bike no one was expecting because we launched three. And all of a sudden, a storm rolls in. So we decide to go early. And the internet doesn't work. And I ran through the streets of Sturgis <laughs> with an open laptop to get to a car and started driving to Rapid City where there might be internet. Um, when oh, the wow. team came and found me at the house we were staying at, apparently, I had driven in half to the the uh, driveway so it was part in the street with the door open it was just hanging <laughs> and i was inside like frantically trying to figure out how to um help our fans see what we were doing so we have all been there 
Yes, we have. So let's uh, let's pursue and uh, and get on with things. So I want to let's focus on the adventure space. I mean, that's a great story about Sturgis, but the the world of boats, motorcycles, off road vehicles. What are the the special factors to consider when you're marketing those types of brands versus um, you know consumer products? I mean, is it a is the the major difference? Is it in buying cycle? Is it in audience type? What do you need to specialize in to be good at marketing in that world? It's a lot of different things. So I think you have to first start with that segmentation. Um, and segmentation is way beyond age, gender, location, and their fiscal background. You're, you're really talking about a lot of times an emotional purchase. And while you may be really interested in Indian motorcycle, the person you are when you're purchasing that is really different than the person you might be buying a Ranger for your multi-acre home in Lexington. Um, your mindset is different. So we really have to think about who you are as a person, as well as who you are making that purchase, because it's just not always the same. So there's a lot of elements there to really uncover and understand and how we reach to you. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know, you're, you're really trying to help people sort of think outside themselves sometimes and, and understand how this fits for them. So there are people who very naturally gravitate towards these products. Um, and again, uh, the biggest portion of our company is really utility based, but we sell adventure and we sell possibilities in the outdoors. And not everyone always sees that as an opportunity for them or thinks it fits for them. So you're trying to help somebody kind of see past and understand how this brings something to their life, which is a little bit different. And then the last thing that I would say is there's a lot of legalities with it. Um, while we sell fun, um, we also sell things that have safety needs and we need people to behave in them a way that's going to keep them safe. And we need to showcase that to them appropriately, which can sometimes be a balancing act of what someone expects versus what you can show. You know, there is a time and place for a professional rider close course. We definitely do that. Um, but there's also a time to showcase something else, right? It's not always going to be that. So those are kind of those balancing acts is like really getting into that. Like, what is this going to make you do from a feelings perspective? Um, diving a little deeper onto that other side of how do we kind of showcase this in the most appropriate way. Very nice. I would imagine from a brand perspective too, from a more of a tactical approach, influencers are, are vital to your company's business because you're, you know, you're selling a lifestyle, you're selling, you know, the belief that someone can aspire to something mm -hmm. big and change, make a big change in, in their, you know, entertainment habits and whatnot. So I can probably pop off a dozen or so people right now who can help bring awareness and aspiration to an audience around boats, bikes, and buggies. But is there a need or focus for influence or marketing on the corporate side as well? And, and if so, what type of people do you influence for your target audiences? Yeah, we, to some of those examples that we use, when I think about influencer, it might be a person, it might be a brand. Um, and so we, we're really out considering people that can play across the board or people that come in where they have a really specific need. We, we signed someone yesterday where they came in with one of our products being the thing they're interested in. And we presented them with an opportunity that's going to potentially showcase a very different product in a different way. And so we're thinking about that holistic, how do we play across the board on those elements that could easily align across. So that's the biggest difference there. I actually have a quite a bit of background in influencer marketing. So the other element is sometimes I get tapped in by the business units to understand how to evaluate, how to look at them differently, how do we treat them appropriately. Um, the other thing, which you can probably imagine, because one of the first questions you had was, how do I get a motorcycle? Uh, we get approached a lot. Um, so I have gotten LinkedIn messages from current NFL players. I uh, We have gotten somehow people get text messages. People get to our CEO a lot. Um, and sometimes they're major players and sometimes they're smaller people who feel like, hey, I can talk about this in this space, give me a free machine. Uh, the biggest thing I would say on that when you come pitch us is we're always going to go back to data. So you've got to have ironclad data. Um, we also want to be strategic about it. It needs to be a really good fit for you as well as a really good fit for us. Um, and the third is we're, we don't have like a vehicle ferry. We can't just like magically make things happen. Um, and sometimes people think that that's the way that works. Um, but it but it's not. It does still cost us money. There's not just some big uh, warehouse in the back that's got, you know, right. hundreds of product in it. It just doesn't really work that way. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think the the one thing that would be really nice to get out of the sort of influencer marketplace overall is the mentality of oh, I can get all this for free if I have a big audience because again, it is a cost factor. And yeah, you're going to have some brands that say, okay, our budget is not going to be cash, but it's going to be product. Yeah. Um, Which we some do a lot. Yeah, yeah, some influencers don't understand though that if you get product, then there's not cash. Yeah. So it's always fun to have to. And you would be you would be surprised at how there's some pretty top tier people we've worked with where it's been product only. It's generally a significant amount, mm -hmm. um, but they live and breathe and love what we do, and that's great. And we just work around what that looks like. Doesn't mean that's the only way that happens, but it definitely does happen. The other thing we tend to find is um, a lot of times if people come to us direct, we can come up with some pretty unique things. Mm -hmm. um, we got pitched by former basketball player who is very, very tall, um, wouldn't perfectly fit in a slingshot while we were at an event in Las Vegas. He and his people came up to us in the gym and we ended up making him a couple machines that were really specified to him. And that was ultimately what he wanted. And he didn't want people in the way of that per se. He just wanted to figure out how to make this work. And so we came up with a cool idea and went with it. There you go. That's a great way to get an influencer to, uh, to love your brand. Um, so something uh, we're exploring here internally and externally at Cornet is identifying how to make creativity your your client our clients' business advantage. So, um, how would you say Polaris, whether it be from a corporate perspective or e even within in e each of the individual brands, how does Polaris embrace creativity and how does that manifest itself in in moving the company forward? Innovation is a seven pillar value. So if we don't innovate, we're not going to sustain. So we are constantly trying to figure out how to push the envelope in a variety of ways. And that could mean through the product as a very natural state. That could mean about additions that we're thinking about with the product from like a digital product perspective. Um, but that also means in how we market and how we think about things. So we really try to drive and push people. One thing that's been unique over the past couple months is that we're running certain leaders through Luma training, so design thinking. So we're trying to help the practice that we have specifically in areas like marketing and innovation drive and be more creative about how they brainstorm and then bring the organization along for that. So again, you know, creativity for us is kind of in everything we do. Um, our tagline is think outside. And we ultimately think about that for employees too, is like, how do you continually think outside? And that's related to nature, but that's also related to thinking outside yourself and thinking outside the box. That last one was not something we like to say, but it is true. Like, how do you continually to push that envelope in whatever it is that's in front of you? Very nice. Uh, ben Whitaker, who is the digital and e-commerce manager for D-Line, uh, which uh, is, uh, if you can see over my shoulder there, there's some uh, plastic covers over my cords there. That's what they do. They make sure everything all neat and safe. Good morning. And so Ben says his doctor said he needed to get his heart rate up. So he bought a Polaris. That's great. There you go. Um, we were having a conversation recently about how we help showcase. There is real health benefits to doing this, not only um, depending upon the product you're on, like you're gonna feel it from a working yourself perspective, but you're also outside. So if you think mindfulness, wellness, all these things, there are so many benefits to getting outside and spending time in nature and pushing yourself on these products in the right way. Sure, yeah, I think I think if, uh... If uh, my once upon a time wife would have realized that the the answer to calming my stress and my and my yelling at things was to put me on an Indian motorcycle and let me ride for a couple hours every day, uh, we would have had a different outcome, maybe. <laughs> Wind therapy is a real thing. So, um, yeah, lots of people, lots of people hop on a product, get themselves lost for a little while, escape, come back, feel like a different person. That is true. So where can people find you and or Polaris on the interwebs? Pretty much anywhere that you can go. Um, we are, you're going to find the brands in all the various social channels. You're going to find us on Polaris.com. Uh, you're going to find us on our dealer websites. We have a number of dealers across the world. Um, so if you Google it, you're going to find it. 
That's awesome. Holly, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Thank you for persevering through the, uh, the technical problems with me as well. And the podcast will come out sounding gold because I'll edit all the crap out. But, uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate you sticking with us today and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you for getting up early. Thank you for having me. All right. That is Holly Spaith. She is the director of uh, corporate uh, branding and partnerships at Polaris. So I dropped the links to uh, the Polaris brand pay brands page over on Polaris.com and to her LinkedIn profile in the comment section uh, over on LinkedIn. So do connect with her and uh, get, your, get, get, your, get yourself a snowmobile there. Get yourself a motorcycle or a four wheel, four wheel, four wheeler. Get out in the woods there back there, the woods there stuff. Yep. So those are good things. So check them out. Uh, uh, ben Whitaker says his Fitbit says he walked 50,000 steps on one good ride one day. Huh, good job, Ben. <laughs> Guess Ben gets that therapy all taken care of when he gets on uh, his Polaris vehicle, which is awesome. All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, and I can't wait for this part, especially uh, in light of some of the technical uh, complications we've had this morning, because it's 835 in the morning and I already feel like I need a drink. Uh, but March 3rd, which is today, is bottled in bond day for one of our clients at Cornet, E.H. Taylor Bourbon. It is a very special day. That's because the man behind the bourbon's name, Colonel E.H. Taylor, was the master distiller who led the charge to petition the government to pass the Bottled in Bond Act on March 3rd, 1897. When you say bottled in bond, you inevitably have to talk about E.H. Taylor. So what was the Bottled in Bond Act? Well, before the government stepped in to offer guidance or regulation to the spirits industry, it was kind of a free-for-all. Whiskey and bourbon back then, remember, we're talking late 1800s, uh, were basically anything that could be stilled and put in a bottle. There were really no standards. And many hacks back then were trying to undercut prices of those who made good whiskey by churning out foul-smelling and tasting swill that was bringing the industry's reputation down. So Colonel Taylor wanted the government, Congress specifically, to step in and say, wait a minute, if you're going to call what you sell whiskey, it needs to follow some guiding principles. So the Bottled in Bond Act was the first, first such regulation on whiskey and thus bourbon, even though back then it was really focused on whiskey as a broad category. It said that to be bottled in bond, to carry that prestigious label, a whiskey must be the product of one distillation season, either January to June or July to December. It must be aged in a federally bonded warehouse, which is bottled in bond. That's where that comes from. Federally bonded warehouse for at least four years, bottled at 100 proof, and the label must include the distillery at which it was made on the bottle and the table. Uh, so there you go. Uh, or on the bottle and the label. Well, the bottle and the label. That's what I meant to say. Typo there. Sorry. Uh, but because of his push to bring consistency and standards to the whiskey industry, Colonel Taylor is often referred to as the father of the modern bourbon industry. So on this day, the anniversary of the birth of standardization and accreditation, for what passes as more than bottom shelf swill, we will raise a glass to Colonel E.H. Taylor. As the toast on the bottledandbond.com website says, may we always have respect for the past and straight bourbon whiskey in our glass. So cheers to Bottled and Bond Day and to Colonel E.H. Taylor. Uh, this is in a Buffalo Trace distillery uh, uh, glass, but it is E.H. Taylor Bottled and Bond. Uh, don't tell the people in the building that I went and got a little pour out of their bottle because I didn't have one. So, Two, Colonel E.H. Taylor and Bottled and Bond Day. Cheers. And uh, that's what I needed to start my day after some technical difficulties. How about that? So if you would like to learn more, uh, there is a website, Bottled in Bond uh, online. That's uh, bottledinbond.com. And um, I believe later today you will be able to find E.H. Taylor's new Instagram and Facebook profiles. So my team is hard at work uh, on those and they will be launched later today. And so with all of the rounds of toasting tonight at various bars across the country for Bottled in Bond Day, you'll be able to go to at, I think, E.H. Taylor Bourbon on Facebook and on Instagram and connect with those uh, with that brand. So the launch of E.H. Taylor's profiles on those two networks. So that's coming up later today, too. Uh, cheers, uh, Husseline and Ben, who have offered cheers as well. I would imagine you're probably not having a sip of bourbon uh, with me in the morning, but if you are, bravo. 
All right. Uh, update on the Dad 2.0 Summit uh, really quickly because we've got to run. Uh, Dad 2.0 Summit in Washington, D.C. this weekend was a fantastic event. There was a palpable feeling of community around this event. So uh, the uh, John Passini and Doug French, the two guys behind it, and the community of people, of dads, dad bloggers, and other influencers in the fatherhood space have done a fantastic job. Uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 or 11 years, I think it's been around, of building great community around that. Uh, there were lots of great sponsors involved, uh, men, uh, uh, Dove, pl or Dove Men Plus Care, uh, Best Buy. Um, um, there was uh, Legoland New York was there to uh, announce or, or partner with people to help announce the fact that they're opening a, a location in New York. Um, there were, oh man, there was there were just Call of Power, Collie Power, I believe, which is a cauliflower based uh, food item you can find in the frozen food section where it's cauliflower crust on pizzas and whatnot, which I tried and were very good. Um, and so lots of other sponsors were involved and they were there to connect with those dad influencers. And so I had a couple of talks. One was on sort of the overall theme um, that Doug French came up with, uh, one of the organizers of um, it's not just if you are a dad influencer, you're not just influencing people about fatherhood, you're influencing other fathers. And so he called it dad fluence, which he admitted was a little bit of a clumsy term. But what I tried to do is sort of explain to them that uh, we are all influencers and we influence different numbers of people in different ways. And so I tried to kind of connect those dots and let everyone know, hey, this is your time as a, as a dad blogger, as an influencer. It's your time to go out there and make your change in the world and the Internet and the technology that we have at our fingertips today lets us do that. So the time is now. It's all in your hands to take that and run with it. So give them a little bit of motivational sort of kick in the pants to uh, be excited about the conference. And then my second talk on day two, I talked about how to help your children become influencers in their own right if they want to and you want to support them in doing that by showing them some examples of my two children, Grant and Katie, doing their things online. Grant is an aspiring rapper, and so he's got a SoundCloud account, and he does some uh, rap music. He has one single on iTunes, and so I'm trying to encourage him. But I'm not trying to drive him. I'm trying to. I'm not make, giving him orders. I'm not telling him how to do things. I'm just letting him do it and and add, answering questions when they come about. I'm a little bit more involved in Katie, uh, my daughter, who has a YouTube channel where she reviews young adult books called KT Reads, and I'm supporting her a little bit more because she's asked me to. My whole point to them was, look, be there to make sure you're safe. You got to, you know cross off the T's and dot the I's of uh, let's have the conversations about stranger danger online. Let's have the conversations about online bullying. Let's make sure that we've got some methods in place to review and, and uh, notify you, you uh, the parent in, in question me if there's something sketchy going on with people trying to comment on your stuff, uh, which you can use apps like Bark for that. Bark was actually there as a sponsor. Uh, so let's check the boxes of, of safety and making sure we understand how to use the tool properly. But then get out of your kid's way and let them create. Let them figure it out for themselves. Let them make mistakes. Let them figure out how to be successful on their own. And then you're there to support them. That uh, uh, happened in uh, Washington, D.C., and a fun time there. So uh, if you get a chance to come to the Dad 2.0 event, I think there's a new one coming up in uh, in the fall, in October, I think. So you can go to dad2summit.com, I believe, to figure that one out. And I've told you this before, but it's worth repeating. I've been invited to serve as one of the keynote speakers along with Jeff Blair, one of our clients here at Cornette at the Influencer Marketing Strategy Summit in Chicago this April. The event is billed as the premier influencer marketing conference to help marketers launch, scale, and measure their influencer programs. Jeff and I will be walking people through a fun case study with his efforts at the University of Kentucky Healthcare System, where he leveraged influencers of all types to support a storytelling campaign. But the agenda for the event is huge. Jim Tobin from Carousel is him saying there's lots of great brands there. It's April 29th and 30th in Chicago. There are some pre-conference workshops 
on April 28th. I think Jeff and I speak on that middle day, the 29th, but the whole thing is fantastic. The, uh, uh, the tickets are available and I have a discount code. So go to jason.online slash I M S Chicago. That's I M as in Mary S Chicago. It stands for internet, uh, influencer marketing, uh, strategies. I M S Chicago. Jason.online slash IMS Chicago and use the code Jason15, J A S O N, all caps, one five, and you'll get a discount off your ticket and join Jeff and me at the Influencer Marketing Strategies Summit. There really isn't an event like this out there that's so focused on influencer strategies. I think uh, this is going to be a, a, a big part of your marketing future for the next few years. So join us in Chicago, Jason.online slash IMS Chicago. Uh, use the code Jason15. Next week on the show, we are taking pictures and talking pictures. Christina Hawatma from uh, Scope.io, Scopio will be here. They are a stock photography company with a specialization in providing more and interesting and more diverse photographs. So we're going to talk about both imagery and its importance, how her company uses artificial intelligence, the importance of using licensed photography, and the mission behind her company. So join us for the live recording of that show with a video stream on LinkedIn at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific next Tuesday. If you can't join us live, the audio recording will hit the podcast feed later that morning. That's Tuesday, March 10th, live on LinkedIn or catch the show wherever uh, you get the uh, podcasts. And I believe we have reached the end of the line here on this uh, Bottled in Bond Day show. That'll do it for this edition of the Jason Falls Show. If you like the episode, share it with your networks or jump over and give us a review on your podcast network of choice. We certainly appreciate that. Look for me on the social networks. I'm jason.online slash LinkedIn or jason.online or slash Twitter or just search for Jason Falls. Until next time, everyone, I'll see you on the interweb. <laughs> <laughs>